Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Sales Enablement ROI, How to Measure and Maximize Revenue, Engagement, and Results. We're so excited to have you here today in our series of webinars targeted towards sellers, sales leaders, marketers, and sales enablement teams. Now, a bit of housekeeping before we get started. I have muted all attendees' lines, and I do recommend that you close other programs on your computer for the best viewing experience. We'll also have a Q&A at the end of this session, so please be sure to submit questions at any time throughout the session in the Questions tab of your GoToWebinar control panel. Finally, quick reminder that this session will be recorded and shared with all registrants, so you can rewatch later or share with your team if you'd like. Now, I'd like to start off by introducing our phenomenal presenters. Today we have Jonathan Carlson, who is a Senior Director of Marketing here at Allego. John's a marketing leader with proven track record of generating demand across various industries. We're also excited to have Charlene Rubin, who is a Senior Customer Success Manager here at Allego. Charlene's responsible for onboarding, training, and ongoing support of our customers worldwide, and has, has excelled in client-facing roles in her entire career. Now, thank you everyone for joining us today. Over to you, John. Thank you, Brianna and Charlene. It's great to be presenting with you. Um, I'm excited to dig into it, into, into this presentation with you because you're in the weeds every day with our customers and have a really good sense for what they're experiencing and, and how hard it is to prove the value of something like sales enablement. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And I'm sure for everybody on the line, uh, first off, thanks for, thanks for attending. I think this is going to be a good session. And, um, I, this must be a topic of interest for you for you guys as well. Um, I know that it's something that I personally have struggled with across my career, not just in, in the realm of sales enablement, but in general, proving the ROI, proving the return of your efforts and what you're working on and on the bottom line, you know, proving its value to the company um, is really important, but it's really hard, right? And sometimes you don't even have the metrics that you need uh, to really convey the value of what you're doing. and 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 it's not always fair that decisions are made based on based on a lack of data. So what we're going to try to do today is, is of course, focus on sales enablement. Right? That's what we, we're here to talk about and and think about it a little bit differently right? in terms of how can you prove the impact of your efforts? What are the different metrics that you can track? What are some processes that you might want to put into place to become more articulate about the value of training and enablement. And at the end of the day, hopefully you'll have some takeaways uh, that you can bring back with you and start to, to work into your own processes and analytics uh, you know, throughout the rest of the year and certainly into next year. And across the way, you know, Charlene's gonna be sprinkling in customer, success, uh, customer stories uh, just to, to ground this conversation in some real world examples. I think it's always helpful. We get very hypothetical in these conversations, but we've got some really tangible examples to share with you as well. So uh, that being said, let's jump right in. Here's a quick agenda for you. Uh, we're going to start off by doing a brief overview of the three primary challenges uh, of demonstrating ROI, right? So we're all, all on the same page, talking talking from the same playbook. They're, this is hard, and these are the three most common challenges that we run across. And then more importantly, we're going to talk about four ways to calculate ROI, to think about ROI, and again, hopefully give you some good takeaways uh, that you can bring back with you uh, after today's session. And then hopefully at the end, uh, we've got a lot to cover, but we should have some time for Q&A as well. So be sure to submit your questions uh, along the way and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. So let's jump right in. Uh, these are the three challenges uh, that we're gonna hit on. We're gonna talk about a lack of data. We're gonna talk about how one size fits all training can be detrimental to, ca to calculating ROI. And we're gonna talk about how time factors play in uh, to, to making ROI uh, uh, on sales enablement a difficult calculation to make. Uh, so let's just tackle them one by one. And Charlene, if you have any thoughts on any of these, I'd love, I'd love to hear them. Um, lack of data is the first one. Data, again, it really in, in any category, in any job function can sometimes be hard to collect. And I think in enablement and in sales in general, beyond understanding you know, how many deals you closed and how much revenue you closed, uh, data between that stage and the beginning of, of the enablement process, which is onboarding and training someone, it's really, it's hard to, it's hard to, to make tangible, right? It's hard to, to latch onto some really, really useful data points. Because um, we're talking about things like individual rep performance versus their learning engagement, right? But how does a rep's performance tie uh, to their engagement with learning and training content, right? Unless you have a platform that tells you those things, uh, it's really hard to know uh, the correlation between those two. Uh, 
sales content performance is is also hard to uh, hard to to uh, to calculate, right? It's uh, and, and when we talk about sales content, we're talking about case studies, slide decks, uh, uh, one pagers, all of the collateral that enablement teams give to sellers. It's hard to understand the impact that those pieces have on revenue. Again, unless again you have a system to, to do that for you, but it's hard. Um, and then just general rep competency metrics. Every single rep is different. They have strengths and weaknesses. Some are really good at closing. Some are really good at prospecting. Some are good at discovery. Some are good at all of it. Uh, but you can't just measure the group, right? You can't just measure the the aggregate group of sellers that you have. You need to understand how each of them thrives or where they have shortcomings in order to fully understand how they need to be trained and how training can impact them. Right. So again, this is this is what this is what's hard <laughs> about measuring measuring ROI. Um, it's just hard to connect specific act activities to outcomes, and more often than, than not, we fall back on anecdotal evidence to give us to give us what we need. Right? People telling us what's working, what's not. That's valuable. We need to know that. But it would be great if we could also have some more quantitative data to fall back on um, to really enhance the stories that we're hearing from the field. Uh, Charlene, before I move on, any any thoughts on this challenge? Yeah, I, I think it, for me it's been interesting um, when I work with new customers. They're oftentimes thinking about you know what they deliver to the sales team, right? As an enablement organization, you deliver all of this content to the sales team. And then you wonder what sticks, right? And just like you mentioned, a lot of times it's anecdotal. Rep says, oh, I really liked this asset or I liked this, this um, piece of collateral. But they don't actually have real data behind it and are able to see what are people accessing on an ongoing basis and what's really helping them um, in their day to day. So I totally yeah. agree. Yeah, it, it's, it's definitely tough. The, the second challenge is this idea of one size fits all. And I think most enablement and training teams do have historically taken a one size fits all approach, right? All sellers need the same information in order to sell. They need to have the same training on products and services. So you give it to them all in the same way. But that doesn't take into account how people learn, how they how they communicate, how they thrive, right? Some people are visual learners, some people aren't, right? Some people like to, to communicate live, some people for, to prefer or have to communicate asynchronously, right? On different schedules. Um, but without segmenting out different learner populations, you know, based on different different uh, characteristics, it's hard to tell what what material and what training uh, processes are driving the success of high performers, right? If you're just lumping everybody all together, you don't actually know what in your enablement is driving high performance versus low performance, right? Because your high and low performers are in the same bucket, um, and it's difficult to see. Uh, you know, how how each of them performs and how each of them engage engages with with uh, with the content that you're putting in front of them and the processes that you're putting in front of them. Um, so platforms and programs that lack the ability to track individualized training, reinforcement, and analytics put you at an inherent disadvantage. But that's where let's face it, most of us are coming from that world, right? We don't have a platform that does that for us. Um, so so this is is something that we're all we're all striving to overcome. Charlene, any thoughts on this one before I move on? Yeah, I think the other thing that I often see is, and, and sales enablement is shifting away from it more now, but, you know, I think oftentimes the way people are training has been very drink from a fire hose type of a method, right? So you go to a national sales meeting or you have a new hire onboarding and you're pummeled with information and then you don't have a way to sort of reinforce or practice that information post meeting. So they're not, you know, from a retention standpoint, that can be challenging as well, where folks are not retaining everything that they learned, especially if, you know, if it was delivered in a way that maybe they're a visual learner and it was all, you know, one of those things. So I think it's um, important to, to, you know, have some variety in the way you deliver the training. Yeah, variety and, and reinforcement, as you say, is key. Because I the metric is something crazy. It's like in between 80% of 90 of what you learn in a training session is lost within a couple of weeks, right, of learning it, unless you have ongoing and effective reinforcement. Uh, you know, that stat has been true for as long as I can remember. But to this point, we've done very little to fix it. So um, definitely an area that we, that we need to focus on. And then just time factors is, is the third category of challenges here. Um, the, the way that we've always functioned, right, in in the business world, uh, is you have a training, right, at the beginning of the year, the beginning of, of each quarter. You get your team together, you go through two days of training, and then you set you set everybody loose, right? And time goes on, deals are closed, deals are lost, 
but so much time passes after the initial training that it's really hard hard to know whether whether or not that training played a large role in in those outcomes right we don't we don't have good connective tissue between training and enablement and and the end of the funnel uh to understand uh training's impact on on the bottom line so that has to change but this this plays exactly into the reinforcement point charlene the lack of reinforcement the lack of continuous learning tracking continuous learning and engagement with enablement materials um, can make it really difficult to confidently say that training specifically changed behavior in the field again you can probably draw correlations right and and Sometimes there, it might be clear cut. Sometimes it might be there might be more gray area. Um, but time factors are something we have to account for, right? We have to find ways to more consistently measure across a quarter, a year, a month, whatever time frame you want. So we have to more consistently measure how enablement engagement is impacting uh, sales performance overall. Anything to add on this one? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about it too, salespeople are inherently incredibly busy. They're out, you know, a lot of them who are field-based are in between meetings. They're, they're trying to consume information and training. And they, I, you know, given I was in sales for many years and I always felt like what you gave to me, if it was relevant to help me hit my number, then I was going to access it. Otherwise, I didn't have the time for it. And we, and people say that, I mean, if I, admittedly, I would say that myself, I don't have time for it. So I think that, you know, being able to deliver training that, is going to help them with their you know overall goals but also takes reduces the amount of time they have to spend doing the training is is always valuable yeah yeah and that's a that's a good point it's one we're going to hit a little bit later so let's let's keep that thought in mind uh before uh, i want to ask the audience what they think about these about these challenges but charlene i now that we've gone over all three just in your experience is uh, have you run across any one of these three challenges more often than the others or have they sort of been equally represented uh, across your clients um, I would say that it varies. Some are sort of higher in the challenges than others, depending on the client. I think that the time component is always a big factor. Um, and I think that the data component is always a big factor. Not having the data behind what they're delivering to see if it's effective in the field is, is usually an, an ongoing challenge with clients I work with. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's not surprising. But let's let's hear from the audience now. So Brianna, if you want to launch our poll question, we're just going to ask you guys, which of the three challenges uh, to quantifying sales enablement ROI do you find most difficult to manage today? So what, what's at the top of your list in terms of the challenges that you are trying to overcome? Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll give you guys a, a couple of seconds to uh, to fill this out and we can we can just see where we're starting from. But I, I completely agree, Charlene. I think, I think um, time factors and lack of data are the ones that I've seen most often and the ones that I struggle with myself, even on the marketing side, just trying to understand how are our programs working? What impact are they having on the funnel? Uh, you know, what 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 different slices of data do we need to prove our points? Uh, it's it's hard, and we become a much more data driven uh, society, right? Mm -hmm. there, there was a time when when this wasn't as important, but businesses today, especially probably over the past year and a half, you know, are looking to justify their investments more than effort. And everybody on this call, we don't need to be sold that sales enablement is important, but you know, when, when you're having those budget conversations, you need to be able to make the case and you need the data points that prove that what you're doing works. Uh, so it's, uh, this, this is tough, but it, it's really important because we don't, we don't want any, anybody on this call to lose steam or lose budget or lose agency to do what, what you know is right. Um, so it, it's, this is, it's a problem that's not going to go away, but we, we've got to rally around it and figure out how to solve it. Absolutely. All right, Brand. I think we can go ahead and uh, close this out. All right, and here are the results. Lack of data, 70%. There you go. That's uh, like you say, not a shock. But glad, glad we're all we're all uh, we're all seeing the same things. We're all encountering the same things. I think this uh, this definitely unifies us uh, as as we move forward in in the conversation. So let's keep on going. Let's let's move to some solutions. For a change rather than just talking rather than complaining about what's hard uh so four different ways to calculate roi we got uh we've got accelerated accelerated revenue reduced costs reduced risk and improved engagement uh so as as we did before let's let's take a closer look at each of them and then we'll talk about some customer stories that support each uh so when it comes to accelerating revenue 
obviously we, we want to know that sales training and sales enablement has an impact on revenue, right? And ideally we're getting more revenue and ideally we're closing deals faster because of enablement. So what are some ways that you can track uh, the impact of, of your training and, and match it back, back against revenue? Uh, this, this plays a little bit into the, the one size fits all challenge. Uh, rather than just rolling the same training out to your entire team in exactly the same way, it might be useful to use discrete training methods on different cohorts of people. So you can, so you can, and that, so then you can track those different co cohorts against each other over time. And that's not to say you should roll out completely different training, right? So you, you want everybody to have the same knowledge, but you might want to experiment with the way in which you deliver the training. Maybe you, you train some people live over a couple of days. Maybe you train some people virtually over a longer period of time. Maybe you play around with how much reinforcement material you, material you provide. Maybe you play around with how often or, or just the medium in, in which that material is, is shared. Um, lots of different ways to do it. But when you start cohorting groups of learners and tracking specific differences in how they are trained, then you can start tracking their relative performance across a quarter, for instance, right? And you can say, oh, group A is performing notably higher than group B or vice versa. And then you can start to draw some more concrete inferences as to why. Right? And it's important, of course, you don't want to put all of your top performers in one group and all of your lower performers, perform, performers in a lower group or in a different group, right? You want to make sure you have variety of persona within each, each cohort uh, so you can draw the right conclusions. But this, while it might take a little bit more work and thought, uh, can be a really good way to truly understand what type of training you're rolling out and how it impacts uh, impacts revenue and impacts the acceleration of deals. Um, and that's, that's what we're always going for. The third bullet point here too is important. Quantify the impact of sales content on your pipeline. This goes back to what we talked about earlier. It's you're, you're creating and sharing lots of sales material across a, a month or a year or how, whatever time period you want. Um, you wanna understand if, if that's impacting the funnel, right? Is, is a case study advancing a deal? Is, is a particular deck advancing a deal? Uh, ideally, you want a platform that can help you understand how that, content is being deployed, how often it's being deployed, how often it's being accessed by clients, and any correlation between the sharing of that content and deals closing or being lost, right? You just want to start to build, again, this, this thread, this connective tissue between all the different elements of your enablement and sales processes so you can start seeing a more full funnel picture uh, from beginning to end. Um, what that looks like in terms of metrics that you should be analyzing, uh, th this, is, this is just a smattering of what you can look at, but we want to look at things like time to first deal, right? How long is it taking a rep to get to close their first deal? What is the average selling price uh, of, of your deals, right? Is that going up? Is the average contract value going up, right? How many of your reps are making quota? Uh, what is the content contribution to deal velocity and average value of, of, of your deals, right? So how is content impacting these, these, uh, these two different categories? If you can start wrapping your head around how these factors are changing over time and tying them back to tra training initiatives, this will give you some really tangible data to work with and present to your team when you're, when you're in the process of justifying or revising your enablement investments. Charlene, any commentary on here before you jump into some customer examples? No, I'm going to speak to it in just a minute, but I think the other thing that has been is an interesting um, metric to analyze that a lot, I see a lot of organizations do is looking at sort of the, the middle of their sales organization, right? Not their highest performer and not the lowest performer, but those people who sort of fall right in the middle there and seeing what they can do to sort of bump that middle up, right? So taking a look at those middle performers and determining whether or not there's an opportunity by delivery of training to over time move them into that higher tier of sales performance yeah yeah that's a great point all right so without further ado let's uh we've got some three mini case studies here and then and then one bigger one so charlene why don't you take it away yeah absolutely so these are just some of the examples that we have from some of our existing customers and success um we have a pharmaceutical organization that was able to get the content into the field's hands quicker so that they were able to sell a drug in half the time. So what may have been a you know long in-person meeting followed by some triple out events, they're receiving the training on a consistent basis, which is giving them an opportunity to be more prepared in the field quicker. 
Um, the next one is one of our medical device customers who was able to demonstrate a year-over-year -year sales of 40% um, or an increase of 40% in five of the six in five of the six regions, um, showing an increase in their quota. And then the last one here is one, and I'm going to speak to them in a little bit more detail in the next slide. Um, they were showed a $1.6 million revenue increase on the first year of implementing a sales and uh, sales learning and enablement program. So these are some pretty amazing statistics from some of our clients who are able to really quantify um, their investment and see what the success was, which is great. Yeah, really good. Um, and then this is one of our um, financial services organizations, Ash Brokerage. <laughs> um, they were able to show a more consistent onboarding process for their new hires. Um, and they were, the reps really needed to deliver more effective messaging over time. So what they did in their first year of using a Lego, um, they were able to show a $328 million increase over the prior year. They had one rep who showed $200 million in sales for the first year ever at their organization. And if they looked at the data in a Lego, they were actually able to see that that rep was actually the highest, the most engaged in a Lego. They were consistently using it for coaching, for messaging, for accessing content just in time. So they saw some, some real correlation between the level of the amount of engagement the rep had with the Lego and that um, sales metric there. Yeah, this is a great one. It's really hard numbers, right? Just this is very concrete evidence that that enablement and engagement with enablement works. Um, and it also actually speaks to, I think, our final point on on uh, this talk track today, which is uh, rep engagement, right? It means a lot uh, when it when it comes to ROI. So, um, yeah, I, I, I love this story. It's, it's a good one. Uh, Second way to calculate ROI, this is a fairly obvious one, cutting costs. Right? We all want to cut costs. It's easy for everyone to understand. Um, it's not, not always what we want, but uh, but everybody gets it, right? If you can reduce costs, that that's a, an obvious benefit. So when we think about cutting costs when it comes to enablement, uh, it, again, let's let's think about how, how trainings are usually conducted often at least annually, usually multiple times a year. Uh, if you've got a big sales team that's across the country, around the world, you're flying everybody in, right? You're renting a conference center, uh, you're ordering food, you're going out for drinks, uh, you are paying for accommodations, right? There's, there's a lot of cost. Sometimes you're paying for an outside sales trainer to come in and do a couple of days of presentations and workshops. Not to say that that's not good, right? I think, I think there are obvious benefits to that structure. However, it is, it's cost prohibitive. So if we can start to find ways to deliver similar, uh, similar trainings and deliver a similar impact virtually and asynchronously, that's going to have an immediate impact on cutting your costs, right? So how do you measure the impact of delivering virtual onboarding training and coaching as opposed to live, right? And then, then when you think about the time, uh, the time factors and, and, and the time, how time factors into cost, right? Because uh, it's not just, it's not just, dollars we're talking about uh where where are managers spending their time where are reps spending their time but if you start to quantify the time of remote managers right so how can we make our managers more efficient uh through asynchronous communication where they can deploy virtual role play exercises for example where they can analyze uh recorded calls more easily and efficiently uh even than you know just sitting along and ride alongs or something like that um, and how can they easily provide feedback at an individual level in a virtual world right how can we how can we take these activities that otherwise are very difficult to scale even especially when you're in person and how can we make a manager's time more efficient um, that that again is actually a form of cost cutting because you're cutting down on the amount of time it takes a manager to execute these activities and you're actually scaling their ability to do so right so we have to think about think about costs in a couple of different ways um, here are metrics, again, to just sort of ground the conversation. Travel expenses and, and venue rentals, if we can cut those out or cut them down, that's obviously great. This, the second bullet is really important. Think about selling days versus training time. Right? How many days is a rep in the field generating revenue for your business versus in a classroom training and learning, right? We want a rep to train, we want them to learn, but we, we want to maximize the amount of time that they are working for your company trying to trying to sell, 
right? That's what we're always going for. So if you think about selling days versus training time, and you think about how a platform like a Lego or something else, right, uh, can can help you deliver training virtually and asynchronous, asynchronously and more efficiently, um, that's a really good way to think about this and way, a good way to, to, to contextualize this conversation of, of enablement impact. Content access and discoverability and content relevance to deals. These last two bullet points really boil down to don't waste your reps time. We don't wanna waste rep time looking for content. So make sure you've got a platform where they can easily find what they need when they need it to advance a deal, right? So something that, where you can easily search for content, something perhaps where, where a platform like a Lego can surface up the appropriate content at the appropriate stage of the, of the sales cycle. That's going to be really valuable because it's not wasting a rep's time. They're not endlessly searching for a piece of content that they end up not being able to find and then creating something on their own. Right? As a marketer, I can say I'm very scared of that scenario, right? Because you never know what happens when a seller tries to create something on their own. Uh, well, we want to avoid that for a lot of different reasons. And of course, you want to make, make sure that the content that they are finding, if they're finding it, is relevant and useful, right? So that you're, you want to make sure that as an enablement professional, you are creating content that has input from sales, that has input from the market um, that you know is going to make an impact, right? And that you can hopefully tie back to sales results as well. Uh, last stat down here, just, just as a call out, transitioning in-person training to virtual live or recorded sessions can reduce travel expenses by as much as $2,000 per person. So if you need you know, a concrete number to put on this, that's a, that's a good place to start. Uh, so Charlene, let's, let's jump into uh, cases on this one. Yeah, and I think that this is one of the ones that a lot of customers that I work with are able to quantify the most quickly, right? And I think that that's a great way to sort of go back to the to the business and their stakeholders and say, hey, look at our cost savings related to training, you know, transitioning from strictly in-person to virtual. And obviously the world we live in now is <laughs> um, yielding that type of environment anyway. But um, I think one of the, the key factors here, and, and I'll, I'll speak to these, but onboarding. I think what was once in a um, in-person week-long or couple week-long training is now being transitioned to um, onboarding. The other value for that is that it allows the rep to sort of self-guide, right? If they're not spending, you know, all their time in the classroom, they actually can sort of go through content on their own and, and consume it as they need to. Um, but where we're seeing our organization show success is cost savings around onboarding. So company Clarabit, Clarabridge was able to demonstrate $800,000 savings by transitioning to um, a virtual training for onboarding. Um, reduced travel expenses, right? So one of our medical device organizations was able to show um, $190,000 reduction in cost by reducing the travel expenses for a launch training for just 55 reps. So, I mean, thinking about that too, it's, it's really expensive. And John mentioned this earlier, but it's really expensive even if it's a small number of folks. And then reduced costs overall. Um, so we have one medical device organization that was able to demonstrate a $1.4 million reduction in cost um, over time just by transitioning to that, that virtual space. And then if we go to um, two of our uh, financial services companies here, both were able to speed up um, onboarding as well. So your time to first deal, your time into the field is also a cost savings, right? If you don't have to spend extra time with the rep um, because they're able to, con to access that information more quickly and become onboarded more quickly, then that's demonstrating cost savings. They're in the field starting to be more effective and hit their numbers sooner. So transition to the virtual sessions and uh, reducing that number, that time in the field. Yeah, onboarding time is so key. Right? Yeah. Just if you can reduce the amount of time it takes a rep to get up and running, you are exponentially increasing their potential output, right? Mm -hmm. Over over the course of a year and even across the course of their tenure. So you have to think about, think about the cost, not just about the speed at which somebody gets up to speed, but the quality, right? That that with, with the, at, at which they are trained. Um, if your onboarding isn't up to snuff, that doesn't just have a short-term impact, that has a long-term impact on that rep, right? Their performance may never be as good because they didn't have a good initial onboarding experience. Um, so it, really, really crucial to, to think about to think about that component as well. Absolutely. 
All right, number three, risk reduction. I like this one. Um, again, uh, it's a concept that everybody can kind of wrap their heads around. We all want to reduce risk in a lot of different ways. Every sales enablement initiative has a positive impact on risk reduction, right? Because we're, we're getting, enablement's goal is to get teams trained and proficient and unified in their messaging, right? And the better they are at that, the, the lower their risk of failure in a bunch of different categories is. Um, but it's easy to talk about this in an abstract way, but we want to assign hard numbers to your risk mitigation initiatives. Um, and, and as we just said, risk concerns serve as excellent motivation to properly fund and support training. So the more specific we can get about how enablement reduces risk, uh, the more likely you are to get support for your initiatives. I really do believe that's true. Any business wants to reduce their exposure to risk. Um, and here, here are four different types of risk that we can think about, um, different metrics to analyze. Regulatory risk, right? So I'm sure many of you are in highly regulated industries, right? If it's pharmaceuticals or if it's medical device or if it's financial services, uh, we all know that there, there's a ton of regulation there. And if you go, if, if rep goes slightly off script, right? And they become non-compliant in terms of how they're delivering information and how they're positioning different products and how they're selling different products, that can expose your business right, in a very high risk way. We want to avoid that. We want to make sure that reps know how to sell in highly regulated industries and avoid any scenario where they might expose your company to regulatory risk. Execution risk is, is different, but equally important. Uh, anybody who, has, uh, who works for a company that has a, a complex service or product knows how much effort goes into product launches, right? goes into, uh, into product strategy and development. Poor sales performance can completely torpedo all of that, th that effort, right? All of the planning that goes into it, that goes into a product launch. If your reps are off message, if they don't know how to sell the, the features that you've been working on, if they don't know how to uh, you know, differentiate against the competition, for instance, um, you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're going to have wasted a ton of time and money and time research um, because your sales team isn't selling what you've developed, what your team has developed appropriately, right? So you need to negate that risk. On the flip side of that is planning risk, right? A huge, probably sometimes overlooked value of a sales team is that they are a direct, uh, they, they directly tap into market feedback, right? Through every prospect conversation, they are gathering information that can help the entire company shift its strategy or adjust its strategy, right? Because they're getting feedback directly from the market. They're getting feedback on whether or not their pitch works. Pitch works. They're getting feedback on whether or not your, your company's product is needed or valued or understood, right? Your team needs to, A, know the questions to ask to get that information, and B, they need to understand how to share that information with the rest of the team and they need a means to do so, right? So at a, at a Lego, for instance, and I'll just talk to you because we experience this every day, reps will go out on a pitch, they'll deliver a demo, they'll get feedback from, from the client, they'll record a video of themselves on a Lego and share that with the entire sales and marketing team, right? And the CS team as well sometimes, if it's, if it's relevant, and say, this is what I learned, right? I encountered this new challenge, right? We need to think about this moving forward. I got this great piece of feedback that I'd never thought about before. We need to work this into our next product rollout, or we need to prioritize this over what we were planning to develop. This has happened a lot, it happens all the time. Uh, but if, if your reps aren't given the tools and aren't given the training to think about this, then that exposes you to planning risk, right? And, and potentially uh, gives you an incomplete view of the market and its needs. So again, this is a good way to think about enablement and how we can mitigate that risk. And then brand risk, right? In-person sales interactions or virtual in-person sales interactions account for 74% of your B2B brand equity. Your sellers are your brand. If you've got bad sellers, they don't sell well, if they sell unprofessionally, they're rude, whatever, uh, that's gonna reflect, reflect not just poorly on them, them individually, but probably more so on your brand. Uh, because they are a representation of everything you stand for. Right? So this is probably the most fundamental risk that comes uh, through through sales teams is just brand representation. So if, if, if your team isn't given the proper training on how to represent the brand and how to represent themselves and how to do it in a professional and uniform way, that's a huge risk. So, so enablement, enablement helps with this. It helps across all of these areas. And, uh, and when done well, really keeps your organization buttoned up 
and uh, away from any any risk exposure. So Charlene, let's let's talk about a few uh, customer cases that that uh, that play off this point. Absolutely, and this is huge. A lot of our customers are are using a Lego to help with a reduction of risk. Not only are you able to effectively deliver the certification, but you're also able to track it, right? So it goes back to the data where you're able to see, are my reps completing the certification? Are they passing it? Um, I have a great way of uh, record of that as well. So I think that's really that's really helpful for our customers. Um, some of the ways that we are seeing reduction in risk is just better training. Um, and I'm going to speak to this, the, the MFS example in just a moment in the next slide, but um, just to having better training and certification over time. Um, being able to show complete certification. So showing that all employees um, are completing a certification. Um, we have record of that certification and we know they're going out in the field and using the right messaging. And then a reduced risk. So we have an insurance company that reported zero problems. So after the fact, after the certification is completed, are the reps retaining that information and using it in the messaging their field in the field? And um, this company was able to demonstrate that. In the next slide here, you'll see um, uh, one of our investment organizations um, did an in-person messaging initiative, and they had 20% um, of the fields the field team failed that messaging. So they did a huge training. They spent all this time and energy and money on the training itself. And then they had 20% of their field team that actually failed the certification and had to go to a remedial training. The next year, they provided remote just-in-time training, and they shared some best practice videos of what good looks like, and they had a 100% pass rate. So this is some really excellent data to show that um, you know, consistently trickling out that information, showing best practices from the field is really going to help facilitate that the passing of a certification. Yeah, yeah. I think regardless, again, of what platform or methodology you use, uh, any enablement program that connects reps, right, and allows them to see what good looks like, allows them to uh, understand you know, how pitches are, are, or how messaging is, is uh is being received out in the world, anything that unifies them on not just a one-time training basis, but across across time, right, on a recurring basis, over time, in the flow of work. We've seen this time and time again, um, how it has a positive impact on their performance, and as a result, uh, reduces uh, the risk that your, your company is exposed to. So, good stuff. All right, last one, number four. Improved engagement. I think I, I like this one the most because it's a it's a positive one, right? It's it's not you know we don't have to be scared about risk, we don't have to be scared about costs. This is just about how engaged is your team, right? Because at the end of the day, that's what that's what's going to really perform for you, and that's what's going to drive results for your company. You can have the best salespeople in the world, but if they're not engaged, if they're not motivated, if they're not connected to their team, they're not going to perform as well as they could, right? So, highly engaged employees perform 20% better they're 87% less likely to leave the company. That is really massive. High turnover contributes to an organization's cost through lost selling time and the need for more new hire onboarding, training, and coaching. Can't overstate this enough. When you lose any employee, but particularly a salesperson, you are not just losing the person, you don't just have to account for their salary, you have to account for all of the costs associated with replacing that person. That's recruiter costs, that's hiring costs, that's training costs, and it's the cost of not having a seasoned rep in the field selling. Again, it goes back to selling time, qualified, high quality selling time. I don't care if you hire the best salesperson ever, it's gonna take them months to get up to speed with your product, right, when you hire them, um, after they go through training and onboarding. That's months of potential lost revenue. So you don't wanna lose good employees, right? We're talking about, we're talking about voluntary turnover. You, you want to you want to reduce that. You want to keep that as that number as low as possible. So, if highly engaged employees are 87% less likely to leave, that is great motivation for anybody um, to to strive to achieve that. And enablement can really help. Uh, so, here are some metrics to analyze. Let's look for some manager visibility and efficiency. Uh, we talk a lot about tracking rep performance. It's also important to look at manager performance. How are they coaching the team? Right? How are they connecting the team? Uh, how are they collaborating with the team? If you've got a platform that can uh, analyze 
call call coaching recordings that can record uh, manager to, to rep interactions. Uh, you can start to track and improve manager performance over time and ensure that they're doing the right things to keep their team engaged, right? And create a positive, productive environment. Uh, team cohesiveness through, through knowledge sharing. Uh, this is something that we do really well at Alego as well, but especially with, with remote teams, you've got to have the tools to keep your team cohesive, connective, collaborative, you know, all the C's. Uh, and and you, you do that through video sharing, right? Through through asynchronous communication, because so many people are in different are in different time zones or are on different schedules, have different personal commitments, especially today. Um, it's not as easy now as just putting everybody in the same sales pen, right? And hoping that they bond, right? You need to make sure that they have tools uh, to stay connected to each other and to help each other learn. Uh, and that, that's what we really preach at Alego is, is not just top down enablement and training, but bottom up, right? Peer to peer learning is huge because sellers trust other sellers. So if you have a, an enablement system in place that not just accommodates for formal training, but accommodates for peer to peer informal learning, uh, on a daily basis where reps are sharing information with each other like we talked about before that is going to create a culture of connectivity and going to connect to create a culture of engagement and investment investment in each other right in trust amongst each other on the team uh, that can't be overstated right so and you can measure this type of engagement if you got a platform through through surveys or platform metrics it doesn't really matter how you do it um, but you need to think about it, right? And and and, um, and you can apply apply these thought these uh, these concepts as as needed to your own business and to your own situation. Uh, employee adoption of, of engagement, uh, sorry, of uh, enablement um, is uh, platforms and, and processes is important. So being able to track individual platform usage and incurring ongoing participation uh, that's important. Th this point really just means. You know, if you're using an enablement platform, make sure it gives you transparency into how each rep is using it, right? How often are they using it? How, how often are they accessing learning content? How often are they creating content? How often, how often are they sharing content? I think like we saw in the case study previously, highly engaged employees who adopt training platforms uh, tend to perform better, right? And, uh, and uh, this, this is just one other way of looking at that. And, and then rep attrition. Uh, Keep track of how many reps you're losing. How many good reps are you losing over time? If you can drive that number down, you're going to be better off. Uh, so that's that's another good one to track. Last set of case studies, Charlene. Let's uh, let's jump in. Absolutely. So, and I think one of the things that's interesting is it's not it's not an ROI metric, but it is an ROE metric, right? Return on experience is rep confidence. So if I look at all of these, right, increased access to a Lego over time where Abbott was able to show 200,000 views in the first 180 days. Um, adoption over time. So one of our financial services companies um, was showing 100% of adoption, 100% of the sales team adopting the platform um, over time. And then increased community. So showing the connectivity, right? And Jonathan, you spoke to this earlier, but the value in increased community, these are all ways that we're helping to improve rep confidence as well, right? So over time, if they're feeling like they're being listened to, if they're accessing content that's relevant to them, if they have an opportunity to connect with their peers, that's helping them be more confident in their role and then this will be more successful over time, which is great. If we look at the next one here is the, the study from Abbott. Um, there we go. Um, so, Abbott, which is one of our medical device organizations, had had um, lack of seller engagement in the training, and they didn't have a ton of reinforcement training. Um, not, none of the field team was ever accessing the platform. And then after adopting the Lego, their engagement really had a massive uptick. They had 200,000 views in 180 days. Um, and they're accessing it voluntarily, which we know means that the, what, the, what is on a Lego for them is relevant for them. And no rep is going to be going into a platform that isn't going to help them be successful in their role. So if they're voluntarily going in on an ongoing basis, it means that the content that they have available on that platform is really relevant to their day-to-day, -day, which is awesome. Yeah, yeah. I think there's often a stigma against sales training and enablement initiatives um, amongst sellers, right? They see it as a waste of time, right? Mm -hmm. I don't need to spend my time doing this. I got to be out in the field selling. It's not actually about the concept of enablement, right? 
it's about trust in in the training that they're receiving it's about confidence that it's going to help them do their jobs right? if they start seeing that value over and over again uh both from the formal side of the training as well as from the informal and and, and peer shared side of the training they're going to want to access it reps this is important reps want to learn reps want to improve it's important to them for a variety of reasons um and we just want to give them the tools to do that on the enablement side um and to do it in a way that is not intrusive right that doesn't take them out of the field too much that doesn't uh it doesn't disrupt their their daily processes too much it's reps are creatures of habit how do you, it's it's our job on the enablement side to fit into their day right to make them as efficient as possible um it's not the other way around they're not obligated i mean they are obligated but they shouldn't be obligated uh you know to fit somebody else's timeline right uh or or the structure of what somebody else think they, thinks they should be doing because at the end of the day, end of the day these are the people who are driving revenue for your company and you need to be able to fit into how they work uh so when you think about enablement, when you think about the return, when you're thinking about getting people and your reps engaged with enablement, always keep that in mind, right? Make sure that you're delivering training that is relevant, that they're going to value, and that they can continually access as they need it, need it over time. Um, and that will, will really help. So that's it. We made it all the way through, just in summary. Uh, we talked about three challenges of uh, demonstrating enablement ROI. It's lack of data, it's one size fits all training, as well as, as time factors that we have to account for and that, and that are tough to overcome. And then we talked about four ways to combat those, uh, those challenges. Uh, accelerating revenue, cutting costs, reducing risk, and improving engagement in a, in a variety of ways. Um, before we jump into Q&A, Charlene, any, any sort of summary thoughts for you on this topic? No, I think this is all, I mean, I think that this has been incredibly valuable. I, I, you know, when I think about my customers that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis, all of these things would really resonate with them in terms of the challenges they face and the way to calculate ROI. I see a lot, again, like I mentioned earlier, I say a lot of customers that are jumping into analyzing the data to see um, about costs, uh, excuse me, about time reduction and cost cutting. So I think that, you know, that's a great area to focus on at the very beginning, because I think over time, being able to show sales performance will be a data point that will take a little bit longer because you have to show some trending over time. But I think j diving into the reduction in costs and the reduction in time is a great place to start. Yeah, that's an awesome point. One that I think we overlook sometimes, uh, at least I overlook it, uh, you know, a platform like a Lego, can do so much and the world of sales enablement is so big and there's so much to talk about uh it often feels like it's just too much right you can't can't even get started because there's so much to do just if you can't tackle all of this right now pick one of these points right to start on to start thinking about to figure out you know what what's what's the most accessible one of these points that you can start building out today and then you can build it out over time right this is this is a journey you just have to keep getting better every day um and you know in a year or two if we can tackle all four at once that's great if we can build on even more points that's awesome uh but don't feel like you have to just because we're talking about all these different factors today that you have to do all of them at once uh so pick 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 the one that makes the most sense for you and, and we'll take it from there all right uh brianna i'm sure we have some questions coming in before we get there uh i, I want to thank everybody for attending i i, I really enjoy this topic charlene it's, it's great great presenting with you uh, amazing insight. Uh, I do want to encourage anybody who's interested in this topic to check out our recent ebook uh, at allegocom slash ROI. It's the complete guide to sales enablement ROI. You'll recognize a lot of the talking points from this webinar, but it goes even more in depth, right? And, and uh, is a really good takeaway for this topic and something that you can share with your teams as well. Anybody who's interested, I really, I, I encourage you to download that. So with, uh, without further ado, Brianna, any, uh, any questions from the, from the group? Absolutely, this was great, but we do have a bunch of great questions as well. So first question earlier in the presentation was from Tony. He was curious about segmenting learner populations. What does that mean and can you share an example? Yeah, Charlie, Charlie do you want to take that? Yeah, yeah. so I think oftentimes um, when I see most of my customers will do it by a couple different factors. I think e the easiest one is by geography, so taking a look at region by region or district by district and doing a comparative analysis like is one district or region doing better than others and why is that 
So I think that that's a, a key um, delineation. Um, the other would be by sales performance. So taking a look at doing an analysis of your upper echelon, your middle and your lower group um, in sales performance and doing an analysis against that. What are they consuming in a Lego? How are they consuming the content and so on? Um, the other would be by role potentially. So if you have folks who carry different products or in or have different roles within the organization, that's another way to sort of slice and dice the data. Yeah, yeah, I think that's spot on. Um, again, don't uh, don't don't slice and dice too much, right? When you're when you're doing this, uh, sort of you know pick pick a category of, of person and, and stick them together and keep it fairly consistent over time, so you've got comparable data. Uh, but yeah, Charlene, I, th I think uh, those are all great places to start. Excellent. Okay, our next question, going back to onboarding, which is a topic we touched on a few times here. Joe was curious if you recommend ongoing testing for onboarding, such as once a week, or a massive learning quiz or test at the end of onboarding. That's a good one. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Charlene, you're probably you're better qualified to answer this one. Yeah, so, so what I see a lot of customers do is that they'll do um, a knowledge check somewhere within the onboarding. So say, for example, it's a week-long onboarding, and maybe you have a knowledge check like two or three times during that to sort of see like, are they retaining the information that is being delivered while the training is being conducted? And then potentially um, do a reinforcement initiative after it. So taking the same content, it's not a new set of questions, right? It's repurposing the existing set of questions and trickling them out over time and allowing the reps to access them over time. I think when you dump it all on them at once, they have a tendency to, you know, panic, to be honest. I think this is a, an easier way and it's going to help them with the actual retention of the information over time. Yeah, I think that's right. And I can even just speak from personal experience in terms of consuming information and being tested on it. I hate nothing more than having just a bunch of content thrown at me, right? Mm -hmm. Just dumped on me and somebody saying, read all this, watch these videos. And in two months, Two weeks, whatever it is, we're going to test you on it. Um, I don't, I don't learn that learn well that way. I like it when I'm given, you know, digestible, easy to manage chunks of information, and I'm quizzed on that over time. Right? The knowledge builds on itself much more naturally that way. Um, not necessarily true for any for everybody, but I, I do think for the majority of learners, that's a better way to consume and test um, on on any information, regardless of what it is. So I, I, I'm with you as well on that one, Charlene. Excellent. Okay, next question was from Merrill, and this came in around the Ash Brokerage case study. So they were asking, outside of the rep kicking butt with their numbers, uh, how are the reps instructed to engage or use enablement tools? So I guess just summarizing that question here, any tips for getting sellers to use enablement tools and start engaging? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest, the most effective way to get them engaged is by leadership communication. So it's a trickle down effect, right? If the leader of the sales organization is bought in and is sharing with the team about how to use, how to be using um, the Lego and what the value is and what's in it for them, I think that's the most, the most easy impact way to get the reps engaged. Is if my manager is telling me to do it, or my management manager is telling me to do it, then I better uh, hop on board and take a look. So I think that's that's my best suggestion. Yeah. The what's in it for me component can't be overstated, right? Yeah. That's that's how you get anybody to do to do anything, but particularly sellers. Uh, what is in it for me? It's always a question you've got to you've got to be ready to answer. Um, but again, it, it goes it goes back to how do they how do they view the content? How do they view the training? How do they value it? Right? Is it going to help them do their jobs? Um, it, it's it's kind of sad, honestly, if you look at the history of of training, um, just like how little that that factor is taken into account, right? It really just is like, let's push this training on people. It's it's what we want them to learn and they're gonna learn it the way we want them to. Um, it's, a, it's backwards. It's a little bit backwards. Um, we need to think more about the reps and how they consume knowledge and the knowledge that they want, the knowledge that they need and continuous improvement and learning, not just on their per, part, but on the part of enablement teams and training teams. If you're a sales trainer, how are you improving, right? How are you advancing your knowledge of your industry? How are you advancing your knowledge of how uh, the sales cycle is working and the challenges that, you're, that your reps are facing? If you're thinking about those things, you're gonna be creating materials that are more relevant to the team, are gonna be more valued by the team. So we all have to be thinking about improvement um, across the board all the time. Great. 
great. Okay, and just in the interest of time, I think we're just going to cover off on one more question. This question was from Bridget. Uh, they were asking, do you have any tips for making sure our reps are using the content that's created for them? So I know as marketers, this one's definitely heavy on our minds. John, do you have anything to add here? Yeah, uh, a lot of what I just said still still holds true. Make sure it's relevant. A good way to do that is actually through content co-creation. Um, so often as marketers or as sales enablers, we are creating content that we think sales teams will use, right? Uh, but it's much better to, to work with the sales team when you're creating content, right? And make sure that it's content that they actually want, right? So that's that can be sitting on sales calls, that can be meeting with, with reps and trying to understand the individual challenges that they're encountering, gathering feedback from the field, and putting that all together as you all create content uh, as, a, as, as a unit, right? As, as a revenue generation unit. Um, it's a concept that I think about a lot. Right, as a marketer, I think so often marketing and sales are kept in their different silos and marketing throws content out into the world and hopefully it sticks and hopefully sellers like it and hopefully the market likes it. But like, it, this is all one engine that we're talking about. So marketing and enablement needs input from sales, needs input from the field in order to make sure that what we think is great and useful actually is. And in almost every scenario, we, we don't know everything. It's shocking, but like we actually don't. Um, so we, again, this goes back to the idea of continuous improvement and just a mentality around improvement and around realizing that you don't know it all and that you can have a good hypothesis around something, but you've got to validate it. And if you're not somebody who's out in the field, in order to validate it, you've got to work with the people who are. And if you're doing that, you're not, you're not going to just end up creating better content. You're going to build trust with your sales team. I keep, keep coming back coming back to that concept of trust, but it has so much to do with performance. If your sales team trusts you as a trainer, as a marketer, whoever you are, the connectivity with the sales team is going to improve. Their willingness to participate and engage with you is going to improve, and then their performance is going to improve as well. Um, so that, that's how I think about it, for sure. Excellent, okay, I think that's all we have time for today. John, if you wouldn't mind jumping over to the next slide. You bet. Thank you. So finally, we'd like to offer today's webinar attendees a sneak peek into Mastering Virtual Selling, which is a new book that's an all-in-one guide to competing in a virtual world, written by Tony Jiri and Alego's co-founders, Yu Chen Li and Mark Magnaca. You can find the first chapter at alego.com slash sneak peek. Thank you, thank you, John, Charlene. This was phenomenal. I think everybody got quite a bit out of today's session. We will send the on-demand recording out to everyone today to re-watch and share with their teams. Please take a moment to complete the short survey that's going to appear on your screens at the very end of the session. Your feedback drives what these sessions look like moving forward. Please let us know any topics you'd like to see. You can learn more about Alego and see a demo at alego.com. Request a demo at alego.com. We'd love to connect with you. Again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, John, Charlene, and all of our attendees today. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.